uh, about three times that size. Um, this one is I re this is the nicest, the best car I've ever seen on a on a wooden box. I, I really I really really like it. I've seen I've seen the real box, and uh, uh, a fellow named John Van Prosen, who is a carver uh, again a, a Haida carver, um, he uh, he carved this and he teaches courses on the West Coast, but they're few and far between, and I haven't managed to get on to one of his courses, unfortunately. Um, the one on the right is kind of whimsical, and a fellow by the James, the name of another native person of non-native name, James Michaels, uh, carves these, and this is a small box, it's only about, only about six inches high, but he's, he carves a number of these kind of, and that's a frog. So it's quite, quite a gamut of different boxes. Uh, of, all the, of all the objects they carve, and there's lots, lots of tone pools of bedwood boxes and little things made of argolite and uh, masks. Uh, there, there's a lot of different um, and silver, silver jewelry. What I like best is the box, and I've really admired the box for a long time. Um, we, Margaret and I, purchased this particular box you see now about 20 years ago. Um, I practiced saying the name um, of the group, the First Nation that um, Samson Robertson belongs to several times, but I'm not going to attempt it again. I never quite get it right. Can you do it? Kwaka waka wakwa. Sorry. <laughs> it's close. <laughs> um, anyway, he carved it about 20 years ago, and, and we purchased it. It wasn't that much. We paid about $300 for it. I went on the internet. Um, Two nights ago, I found out a very similar box, now sells for more than the car, but at the same time, sells for more than $2,000. Now, I certainly didn't buy it for because it was increased in value. I just bought the one because I liked it. But some of this stuff does increase in value. Um, now, I, I got really lucky because I say J John Van Prosen wasn't teaching, of course, but probably a fellow who was an even better teacher. Um, maybe not as good a carver, but a better teacher. Uh, Steve Clay Brown, he's actually not native, but he, he's really steeped in their lore. He was teaching a five-day Bentwood box workshop um, in Port Townsend, Washington, in Washington State. Port Townsend's got a very good woodworking school there. You, um, and um, they have a lot of guest people come in and, and teach courses and everything. So I sprung and went all the way out to Washington State and spent the week with Steve, and it was well, well worth it. Um, I've been looking for some kind of instruction somewhere. I even appealed on the forum, does anybody know any place I can get instruction? And uh, eventually I found a course that Steve was teaching. And um, first thing you do when you make a wet wood box, you get a plank. This is, a, this is um, yellow cedar. And that's by far the nicest wood to carve in my, just really nice wood to carve. Um, and the first thing you have to do is cut these little curves in the wood three curves. They have to be spaced properly so the wood's going to, because basically you're going to bend the wood on the curves. Um, and they have to be spaced so that they're going to make a nice square or a rectangle when you're finished. Um, and the fourth side is actually a butt, not a, well, it's, uh, it's um, a rabbit, but it's a rabbit, it butts into the rabbit at the end. Um, cutting these curves is really easy to say, but hard to do. <laughs> uh, uh, and I just for the act of it, I went on the went on the web to see. Does anybody create a router bit to do those things? Not that I never use it, but you think that somebody that's mass producing these things might have a router, but I couldn't find one. You could you could use the hand router. It's a I got one at home. It's it's kind of under wood, and the cutter comes down, and you just kind of curve on both outside edges, and it routes the wood in between. Okay. Well, you see that? You see the way this is shaped, though. It's shaped like a, a bird's beak. It's not. It's oh, not I see what you mean. Yeah, it's not square. No, it's, it's definitely not, not square. No, I see. So it folds. It, it's, it's got this very thin little uh, bit here that's going to stick yeah. together when you make the make the, the band. But you could with that rotor thing take it down so deep. Oh yeah, let me you can, that you, in with the Right. You can anyway, I'm not about to do okay. it. And it just it just it, it just was interesting. I couldn't I was interested uh, that I went to try and find it. Uh, what you actually do, now my wood was warped, which made it a little more challenging. 
Um, but I had a, a Japanese Azbeki saw, and although my wood was warped, I took, I followed the line of the of the saw and drew a, drew a line on there at the right depth, so that no matter where I was on the on the warp, it would cut to the right depth. And that worked pretty well. And essentially, this obviously I could have rounded because it's just a it's just a dado essentially, the first part of it. Cleaned it up with a chisel. But then what I had to do was cut, you want to cut in, because you want to go down into here. So I cut a 45 degree angle, essentially from one corner in on the other corner. And you can see my lines marked there. I wanted to go down to hit that line. Then, the best thing by far, oh, I forgot to bring them. I have three bent knives, which are the traditional knives that they use on the, uh, what the native people use. Um, I didn't bring them with me. Um, my bent knives, um, Stephen taught a three-day course before this one where you went and made your own knives. Uh, I didn't uh, go to that <coughs> course. I cheated and bought the blades from a fellow on Haida Gwaii. Um, he sent them to me. And then I made my own handles. But um, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't bring them. I was going to leave something behind. Uh, anyway, then you can... Um, the, the last side, as I mentioned, the board was warped. So I um, had to cut a rabbit. And that was kind of tricky on the, the rabbit. Because yes, I could follow the same technique for the, for the vertical. But then I basically cut <laughs> with a knife. I cut the, uh, cut the other side to cut it off. That's me. Um, so that's the rabbit being cut. Um, the third step is to soak the plank, at least overnight in a bathtub or something. Somehow, with a river, I don't know. Somehow, get the darn thing to soak. Well, all I did was I just took, spent about an hour pouring water with a kettle on the on the places where the curves were, and that really wasn't what I should have done. <laughs> I should have soaked it uh, because the next thing you do is you stick it in a steam box, and that's my plank right there in the steam box. Uh, of course, you shut the lid when you're actually steaming it. But I opened it to take the picture. Then what you do is you bend it. And when it's nice and soft, it's, it really is just like bending, I don't know, uh, cardboard. It's really very, that's a picture of Steve bending, uh, bending it properly, bend, uh, bend, making the joint. Um, so if the thing's been curved properly, soaked properly, and steamed well, it's going to bend very well for you. Uh, my plank was well curved, it was well steamed, but as I said, I didn't soak it long enough. So first time I'm going, crack! Oh God, what am I done? And there was, and there actually was a, one of those joints. It got the, 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 the little thin, two millimeter thick little flap you're supposed to have cracked right through because it hadn't been soaked long enough. Um, it was only about a third of the, it was the middle third of the, of the joint. And the other two joints did, did manage to not have any wood, uh, not, not any holes in it. But I ended up with holes in my box. So what I did was I just I just carried on. <laughs> I you can see here, see the kind of a ridge of wood. That's okay because that's excess wood which you're gonna which you're gonna take off as long as there's still a continuous uh, piece of wood all the way around. You're all right. Uh, what I did was I I didn't really trust myself, so I didn't actually cut my blank to length. I waited until I made all the bends, and then I marked where I, should, where I should be cutting the end of the board to fit into the rabbit, and then I cut it at this point. Um, I, on the, the last side, I secured it with uh, pegs. They would usually use willow. I used bam, bamboo on the diagonal. I also cheated by putting in a, a wedge here to make sure it was a 45 degree angle, and glued it. I put a, 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 stra a strap clamp around it. I uh, expect they wouldn't be doing it. They just rely on the base. So then I showed you where there was some excess material on the corner. That's me sanding it off. Uh, the bottom. I have to put a bottom on it. My bottom is uh, is uh, red cedar, and all the wood we have is a little warp. So I had to hand plane it to get it smooth and you know. Because you couldn't be using a planer or anything here. 
and then I cut rabbits on all, all four sides, and then just attach the pot, the bottom to the box with um, pegs and uh, glue again. Now, <laughs> how about the design on there? It's very abstract. Um, Steve really is a really well-known artist, and I talked to him about the design, but he basically drew it. I, I didn't. I said I would like eyes and mouth, and yeah, that's where I'd like it. But it was essentially his design. Um, and um, so I trans he drew the patterns on paper. I have a piece of paper here. This is one of the pieces of paper that, that Steve drew. And then what the thing is, it's really a mirror image. So if you have half the tail, etc., on that side, then you just reverse the picture and draw, put the other half on that side. So the, as you can see, the, the face is around one corner, the tail and everything is around the other corner. So that's the, um, that part of it. Um, that, that's as far as I got on the course. Um, I essentially didn't, I was happy to get that much done. I came back home and I mixed up, a, now we're working in my shop, there's a combination of epoxy and sawdust. Oh, that's great stuff. <laughs> so I filled out all the holes that I that, that had gone through, sanded them off, and you couldn't see, couldn't see anymore where my holes were. Probably stronger than the original box. Um, now, the carving. I mentioned before, traditional carvers would use these, um, the bent knives. Uh, I'm much more comfortable with a set of flex cut tools that I've got. These are the tools that are sold at Lee Valley and a lot of other places as well. Um, they're made in the United States, and there are a number of blades with interchangeable handles. And I've got probably about 40 of them, but I end up using about five or six. Some are some I hardly ever use. But anyway, um, and I needed a top. Uh, I got, as you know, the city of Toronto has been killing ash trees, and they, they don't do what they should be doing, which is, in fact, the ash, the ash wood is perfectly good wood. And they're, you know, they're discarding it. So you can, the, 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 the bugs that's killing the trees is not going into the wood itself. It's between the bark and the wood. So if you take the bark off and uh, treat the wood properly, get some really, really nice wood. And some communities are actually saving the wood and um, setting up industries and uh, but Toronto just seems to be throwing them away or landfilling them. But um, uh, Rod Sheridan got, got a bunch.